Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So the ABC, Australia's taxpayer funded TV network, hosts a political program every Monday night called Q&A, which in recent years has skewed very much leftwards. Thus it came as no surprise that on November 4th, the program featured an all female panel with a female moderator, radio host Fran Kelly. The panelists were Egyptian American feminist and founder of the hashtag Mosque Me Too movement, Mona El Tahawi, anti-ageism author Ashton Applewaite, anti-domestic violence author Jess Hill, social change agent Hannah Asafari, and indigenous screenwriter and activist Nayuka Gori. Now this affirmative action panel was billed as a fearless feminist progressive offering, the kind that pretends to be boundary pushing but is actually quite mundane and politically correct. However, when these women opened their mouths, it became apparent that this was not your average panel of whiny feminists. These women's views were those of extremist identitarian anarchist agitators. Between them, they advocated for citizen executions, the abolition of the police, the end of incarceration for criminals, the mass harassment of people they don't like on social media, and the use of political violence as a handy approved tactic. Oh, and they also really hate white men. These old white men, mostly, who are saying, no, we want to keep our, our hands on everything. There was also this. I just want to take the opportunity and talk about climate change. No, God, please, no, 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 no! Now, I don't actually have a problem with these views being expressed on TV. On the contrary, I believe in free speech for everyone, including those people that I disagree with. Nevertheless, the ABC received 200 complaints. As such, they pulled the replay from ABC iView and have launched an investigation to determine whether or not it breached ABC standards. Thankfully, somebody managed to get the episode onto YouTube, so if you want to watch it, it is in the video description. The big issue people seem to have with the episode is that there was zero dissent on the panel, including from the moderator. As such, these views that are very much niche, radical, and violent were presented as somehow reasonable and mainstream. That's not good, especially on a taxpayer-funded network. So I'm going to go through this episode because, and I mean this sincerely, it was the most important hour of television globally, I think, of 2019. This is because it once and for all exposed the regressive left and radical feminism for the insidious, violent, extreme, man-hating, white-hating, Christian-hating, fact-free demagoguery that it is. So please watch this video all the way through, and if you like it, please subscribe to my channel. It is very, very important that you hear this. The first thing these women exposed is feminists' hatred of straight white men. Now, we've all heard feminists flat out denying that they hate men and that it's just a stereotype and that really they care about men and want to help them and that feminism is good for men as well as women, blah, 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 blah. But we all know that is not true. And that was demonstrated very effectively by Mona's relentless suggesting that we live in a white supremacist patriarchy. What we have to do is start seriously talking about dismantling patriarchy. And when I talk about patriarchy, I'm talking about a white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist patriarchy, to quote Ameri black American feminist bell hooks. Because what I'm hearing here is very similar to what's happening in the United States. But I also urge everyone to connect it to what so often in the news is portrayed as a problem in my country of birth, Egypt, where police brutality is connected to a fascist state or a militarist state. You rarely make that connection between the dictatorship in Egypt and here in Australia where you're ostensibly a democracy. But what you're talking about is the overwhelming power of the state. And that state is driven by a white supremacist patriarchy. Because we're talking about a very specifically male kind of violence and again, according to the tentacles of the patriarchy. There's that word again. So for me, we have to have a serious discussion. We have to dismantle patriarchy. Now, the very notion that we live in a white supremacist patriarchy indicates a hatred of white men because it depicts their very essence as harmful and oppressive. Now, this would be correct if we actually did live in a white supremacist patriarchy, but we don't. Social values in the West are based on equality, fairness, compassion, respect for human rights, and freedom. People who speak against those things are rightfully publicly condemned, and people who break the laws that we have in place to protect these values and rights are arrested, tried fairly, and punished if found guilty. 
None of that would happen if we actually lived in a white supremacist patriarchy. White supremacism is a very specific thing and it's a term that's been tossed around far too frequently of late by ideologues who are running out of things to complain about. Now, this fantasy that feminists push of a white supremacist patriarchy is a projection of their internalized hatred and resentment of white men. It's pure bigotry based on nothing other than their own longing for a common enemy that they can denigrate with no condemnation in order to make themselves feel better. The other panelists also betrayed their seemingly innermost thoughts about men, according to Hannah. Positive masculinity is an empowered woman. <clears throat> <laughs> who, who raises and teaches and, and um, will nurture attitudes of respect towards women. Which, interestingly enough, post-show, she tried to distance herself from. My other issue on Q&A that I didn't have the opportunity uh, to contribute to is on men. I'm a mother of two boys and I have brothers and I have a father and we all have cousins and uncles and grandparents. The role of men is not to fear women. I don't want men to fear women, nor do I want women to fear men and be intimidated by them. I want us to work towards a different and imagine uh, a different and more harmonious world. Nayuka also had an interesting perspective on men through the lens of her current pregnancy. Initially, I was scared. I was like, what if I raise a cis straight man? <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And there's more. I'm urging the straight, the cis straight men out there, there is something deeply broken the in you and in the way that you move through the world. As you get older, Learn from people like us so that this can be a better world. Be queerer. Be more bisexual. <laughs> be less cisgendered in okay. the way that you move through the world. I mean, really? But this misandrist feminist attitude wasn't just represented through narky quips and posturing. It was their embracing of political violence against patriarchy, that is, men, that truly revealed it. Here was the question. When trying to bring, out, bring about significant change, when is aggression and violence a better option than assertiveness, strong arguments and modelling the behaviour you expect of others? And here are four out of the five women asserting that political violence is an appropriate tactic. It's never the, the ideal, it's never the first thing to go to. Mm. But, you know, slave rebellions, I mean, there are many causes where people have resorted to violence as a way to finally break through and get hurt and achieve what we need. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I, I, I want patriarchy to fear feminism. I want women themselves. I want, as a woman, I'm asking, how many rapists must we kill until men stop raping us? That violence has been allowed to continue, unchecked mostly, uh, by men, especially privileged men. So exactly how long do I have to wait to be safe? I think if anyone's shocked by what Mona's suggesting, you just have to look back to history and a certain faction of the suffragettes in the early 20th century, they used violence. They actually, they thought what they were fighting was a civil war between the sexes. They were fighting for their lives. I wonder what our kind of tipping point in Australia is going to be when people are going to start burning stuff. Um, I look forward to it. We live in a colony. Like, I cannot, we've tried for 230 plus years to appeal to the colonizers' morality, which just doesn't seem to exist. Um, <clears throat> so it's, I think violence, yeah, I think violence is okay. Let's really burn stuff. Let's really burn stuff. Let's really burn stuff. Really stuff. Interestingly enough, if you look at the world through their lens, their arguments actually make total logical sense. And they make them so convincingly. Lots of big words, nice, thoughtful, earnest tone, appeals to emotion. You know, you can see why the gullible are so duped by them. But the thing is, the prism through which they view the world, the Western world that is anyway, is just not real, as I mentioned. They are trying to compare Australia and other Western countries to places like Uganda and Egypt and Iran, and apparently to the early 20th century suffragettes and also historic slave revolutions. You know, places and time periods where equal rights actually don't exist, and where there actually is a violent oppressive regime, and where people actually are trying to kill or physically harm you. But we are not living in that kind of society. 
And sure, there are problems, but not those of a white supremacist oppressive patriarchy. And yet, these women still somehow convince themselves that they are living in one of the most violent, unequal times in human history. So why do these women and those who agree with these women make these fantastical claims? Well, I think there are two reasons that people buy into this regressive, radical leftist oppression ideology. First, they're damaged. They've suffered some sort of trauma and are looking for a place where nobody is going to blame them. This allows them to project their personal experience onto the rest of the world, thus justifying and normalizing those experiences and making them feel less alone. It's a kind of coping mechanism. The second reason, however, is that these are people who have an inherently violent totalitarian streak. Now sure, they may also have suffered some trauma and maybe want to make the world a better place, but there are plenty of people who want to do that without insisting that we are living in a violent patriarchy where violence is necessary to dismantle it. These kinds of people are simply looking for ways to exercise their violent nature and justify their bigotry, if not by doing it themselves, then by egging other people on. The trick is that they excuse it under the guise of working for the common good. They justify their online pylons in a similar way by depicting any kind of reasonable dissent as somehow a threat to their very existence. So no, I do not have the luxury or the privilege to sit there and be civil with people who do not acknowledge my full humanity. I refuse. This painting the situation as so bad that violence is the only option is characteristic of every extremist ideology since the dawn of time. And it is so exposing of how hateful they all are and their loathing of men. If the women on that panel heard that kind of language used about any other group, they would rightfully decry it as hateful. But since they have painted white men as the oppressors who must atone for their sins and the sins of their ancestors, they insist this justifies their hateful conduct. It is quite sociopathic. Now, to be clear here, I am not saying that any of these women on the panel are themselves violent. Gosh, no, please don't sue me. I'm just saying their words are characteristic of a mentality on the radical left that I have been noticing for some time. Just so we're clear. Another thing this panel exposed is that radical fourth wave feminism is sadly lacking a basis in facts. This lack of facts was on full display in their discussions about homelessness, domestic violence, and violence generally. First, consider this comment made by Hannah during a discussion about aged care in Australia. Coincidentally, the highest group of homelessness in this country are women over 50. Okay, so that's not true. Women over 50 are not the highest or largest or broadest homeless group in Australia. They are the fastest growing group, which is certainly of concern, but it is a very specific example that does not actually reflect the scope of homelessness. According to the 2016 census, which is the most recent data, 16% of Australia's homeless are aged 55 and over. By contrast, 59% are below the age of 35. Now to steal man Hannah's argument, let's add half of the 12% of homeless people between the ages of 45 and 54, since her assertion was women over 50. So we'll say 22% of Australia's homeless are 50 plus in age. The majority of that 22% are men. In fact, the majority of Australia's homeless population overall are men, 58% to be precise. So no, the highest or largest homeless demographic in Australia is not women over 50. Depending on how you want to split the data, it is most likely men and boys under the age of 35. So why make this very false statement? Well, I'm thinking Hannah actually meant to say that it was the highest growing demographic, but nerves and adrenaline got in the way. Let's give her the benefit of the doubt. Either way, nobody on that panel questioned or corrected her. They just ummed and aahed and nodded in affirmation. Everyone was perfectly happy to accept the narrative that women are the victims in homelessness. And that right there is one of the ways these kinds of feminists paint this big, bad, scary world for women. They tell only half the story. And honestly, it's so indicative of the bigotry of low expectations that white leftists have that the white women on the panel listened to a woman of color say something that anyone with even a basic knowledge of homeless statistics would know is most likely false. But their response was simply, <coughs> Second in their parade of factlessness was, of course, their discussion of domestic violence. They presented it as a gendered issue caused by gender inequality and disrespect for women. That we are and have leaders who speak in ways, and unwittingly or deliberately, where they 
uh, message and give signals to men in terms of male behaviour. I find it problematic and disconcerting that we're saying, oh, well, you know, the gender equity conversation hasn't worked and we still have increased incidents of violence towards women. What is it that we're getting wrong? What we're getting wrong is the doublespeak. It's mm, the attitude mm, mm. that gives legitimacy 100%. to the treatment of women. Okay. okay, here's the thing. Domestic violence is not caused by gender inequality. The catalyst runs deeper as revealed in a recent major study into domestic violence in Australia by the Australian Institute of Criminology. According to this study, which was released in September and examined 39 quantitative studies on the topic, domestic violence is hugely concentrated in disadvantaged, low socioeconomic communities and alcohol was a driving factor not gender inequality. No shit, Sherlock! The study also found that a tiny minority of men who are repeat offenders were responsible for a disproportionate amount of the abuse, and stated that there is growing recognition that domestic violence offending is concentrated among a relatively small group of offenders or couples. Finally, it found that a median of 36% of domestic violence incidents were alcohol-related and that alcohol use was associated with more severe acts of violence and was more likely where there was evidence of escalating frequency and severity of violence. So, no, it's not because of men in power condoning the bad behaviour of other men. There is a far simpler explanation. And while, yes, tragically, female victims make up the majority of deaths in intimate partner violence, that is not the whole story. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in 2018, 47% of family domestic violence related homicide overall, so not just intimate partner violence, were males. That is, 75 deaths were women and girls, and 65 deaths were men and boys. It's not a lot of numerical difference. But do we ever hear about those male victims of family violence from feminists? Of course not. And if we do, it's with the qualifier, yes, but men predominantly are the perpetrators. Well, so what? Does that mean that male victims of DV deserve less sympathy and recognition? How callous and cold from women who claim to be all about compassion. This leads me to the third fact-free assertion the women on this panel made, that we are living in a violent patriarchy where women are in constant danger of being harmed by men. How long must we wait for men and boys to stop murdering us, to stop beating us, and to stop raping us? Here's the thing. While women are the primary victims of sexual violence, men are actually the primary victims of violence generally in society. Again, according to the ABS in 2018, about two in three victims of murder and attempted murder were male, as were 74% of victims of robberies. Also, men are more likely to get attacked in public places than women are. Women are safer on the streets than in their kitchen, since women are more likely to get attacked at home. Again though, if you put that to a feminist, she will again use the qualifier that most of the perpetrators of violence are men. Again, so what? Men are physically stronger than women and more aggressive because they have more testosterone. Of course they are more likely to act in violent ways than women are. That should not be a shock to anyone, nor is it evidence of some culture of toxically masculine violence within the ranks of men. It's just biology. That doesn't make it okay, but it doesn't indicate that men are afflicted by some sort of original sin of toxic masculinity. If you're Aboriginal, a woman, Muslim or trans, everything wrong in your life is because of white men. The November 4th episode of Q&A was the single biggest expose of radical fourth wave feminism we have seen for some time. The women on that panel seem to live in this falsified world of patriarchy, a white supremacist violent nightmare world based on cherry-picked statistics and their own projected self-interest. They have created this world because they are damaged, self-obsessed people who desperately want to feel like they are part of a cause, when in reality they are just a bunch of privileged, middle-class women with too much time on their hands looking for something to complain about. You know, imagine being so privileged that you have the luxury of viewing the world solely through the prism of gender and race, rather than paying the bills or holding down a dreary 9 to 5 job, and then having the hide to pretend you are somehow oppressed. So please share this video, it is so, so important to see the lies and toxicity behind modern feminist ideology. After all, sunlight is the best disinfectant. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.